December 1st is World AIDS Day, when we pause to remember those who have succumbed to this disease as we recommit ourselves to find a cure to open people's minds to make us all aware. Um, and so I share these words from Maureen Killeran, and after which I will be lighting a candle. It has been a long struggle, and our work is far from over. As we go forth, may we be empowered by the spirit of hope and healing, whose one name is God, and whose other name is love. May the blessings of love be upon us and within us. May love's truth be upon our wisdom and our vision. May love's wisdom dwell within our hearts. May love's persistence inspire our lips. May love's gentleness give comfort to our bodies. May love's gratitude accompany our sleep. May love's healing be a balm for our brokenness. May love's serenity give peace to our souls. May love's confidence energize our minds. May love's challenge keep us faithful, faithful in our struggle, faithful in our conviction that love and justice and hope will ultimately prevail. In honor, in memory, and in renewed commitment, we light this flame. So I wanted to show you just real quickly, uh, when I was in Transylvania this summer uh, in um, some Hungarian-speaking homes, I have a friend who's a Transylvanian minister, and she had made this for me. It's, it's the words of the Seke Aldash, the house blessing, in English, and, um, and I have it now hanging up in my house normally. Um, but people do really have the, the words of this hanging in their houses um, to remind them that, you know, where there is love and, and peace and where God is, that, that the house is blessed. So I just in the Christian calendar of Holy Days, today is the first Sunday of Advent, the time of waiting before the coming of the Prince of Peace. There are four candles in our Advent display. And there are four opportunities to pause, not just to pause, but perhaps to wait with anticipation. This Sunday, we light the prophecy candle, which symbolizes hope. So I bring the flame from our chalice, our common flame, and we light the first candle of Advent. You know, hope is different from wishing. We might wish for a new bike, but hope is what makes it possible for us to get up in the morning. We come together each week to renew our hope and to prevent or at least disrupt hopelessness. This candle represents hope for a better tomorrow. As the prophecy candle, it commemorates the Hebrew prophet Isaiah, who foretold the coming of a savior, not arriving with an army, but in the helpless form of a child. We wait in hope, and in that waiting, we light a candle to dispel the dark, and we raise up a prophetic voice to bring more hope into the world. Devin Southall and her daughter, Emma, are going to share with us some ways to bring more hope into our world. So come on up, y'all. We all know about reduced reuse 
recycle. But have you heard about the seven R's of sustainability? There are rethink, refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle, and rot. For the next few weeks, we, were, we are going to focus on recycling. Pictured here are two bins. Show of hands, whose recycling bin looks more like number one? What about, how about number two? Good job, everyone. So, number one is problematic because of the plastic bags. Plastic bags become tanglers in the industry. So the city of Rochester last year did a video last summer, and they said that they have to shut down the entire plant at least once an hour while the workers climb into the machinery and remove all of the plastic bags and other tanglers so that the machinery can start back up again. What are tanglers? So tanglers are things like rope, clothing, garden hoses, plastic bags, and Christmas tree lights or holiday lights. There was a survey that the City of Buffalo Recycling did on Facebook last week of vote of whether holiday lights could go in your recycling bin. 20% of people thought that holiday lights could go in your recycling bin. Ah. <laughs> so, no plastic bags. Take the bin out to the recycling tub and dump it in loose. Don't bag it. Now, my homework to all of you, if you're not taking your recycling out loose, take it out loose. Number two, my homework to all of you is to talk to someone. I like to do the straw man. You know, I was hearing at church that most people, the number one problem with recycling is that people bag their recycling. Can you believe that? And feel free to mention the Rochester video um, because the city of Rochester put a lot of effort into shooting this video of how it bagged. And actually the city of Buffalo Recycling shot a video of the recycling line about a month ago. Plastic bag, plastic bag, plastic bag. Literally, that's what it looked like. So that's your homework. Excellent. Thank you. So th when I told a friend the title for today's service, The Reason for the Season, they looked baffled for a moment and then said, but how do you talk about that when not everyone come is celebrating the coming of the baby Jesus? Exactly. There are many reasons for the season, and we are going to explore some of the possibilities, your reasons for the season. Because whether or not you choose to celebrate Hanukkah, Solstice, Christmas, Kwanzaa, or any of the other 20 or so holidays packed into the next 30 days, our culture expects that you will and that you will be filled with joy and goodwill, and nothing but sugar plum fairies will dance in your dreams. And you know, the holiday machine is a hungry beast, greedily gobbling up the contents of your wallet and your very reason. Every measure of success in our culture is tied to our role as consumers. Think about it. Consumer spending, the consumer price index, consumer confidence, retail sales, manufacturing. So let me be clear, we are more than consumers. You are more than a consumer. You are a unique expression of the universe and you are designed for significance and meaning. You are a person with vast wells of creativity and curiosity, and you have unfathomable depths of possibility and potential. If you get nothing further from this worship service, please hear that you are blessed and that you have the permission and the power to say no to the holiday machine. Now, Christina and I are not here to make you feel bad about your decisions to participate or not in the excess of the season. Sometimes, 
Mae West is right. Too much of a thing can be wonderful. But I'm pretty sure she was referring to something other than holiday festivities. <laughs> Rather, we are here to engage in some conversation about what makes this time of year meaningful. And if it's more manic than meaningful, to invite us all into some deeper reflection and possibilities for finding a little bit of peace, a little bit of joy. And so, I am pleased to welcome you to our fireside chat for the reasons for the season. Festive. <laughs> oh, I left my slide mm -hmm. thingy. All right. Well, as we gather around the fireside, we have been thinking at the start of this holiday season about the reasons that we're doing this and, and what our intentions are about how to celebrate our holiday. And, you know, as I was plowing through my many, many Black Friday emails about all the sales and all the exciting discounts that I could have if I ordered things on Black Friday, I came across something a little different in my email list. And it was from the Lion's Roar, which is a Buddhist magazine. They had a slightly different take on the holiday. And I came across this quote. If consumerism is America's religion, then Black Friday must be its holiest day. <laughs> On this day, millions of Americans congregate in public spaces to make devotional offerings to their sacred brands. <laughs> well, we know that as long as we exist in this world, we have to breathe, we have to eat, we have to wear clothes pay taxes, but even though we have to consume to survive, we can, ex we can aspire to consume in a way that prevents harm and promotes benefit. So even though we are encountering all the hoopla of the season this year, and as I drove down Main Street to get here on this strange sleety day, I came across beautiful displays in the shop windows of Amy's Jewelers and Johnny's Cleaners and these beautiful fantasies of what winter looks like in western New York. But our reality is a little bit different here in December, on December 1st. It's a slight disconnect uh, with our fantasy versus reality. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. But when we talk about the reason for the season, we need to peel back all the historical and even astronomical layers of why we're here, why we have this holiday at the end of December. And the simplest explanation, of course, is that here in the Northern Hemisphere, things get very dark. The longest day of the year, the dark and the cold, seem to cry out for something to get us through the winter. And so people, for millennia have celebrated that winter solstice day as a special day of light and community and warmth. And in some ways we're no different, but in other ways we've, we've replaced the natural light that we used to experience with, with electrical lights, electrical fires. We've in some ways overcome all those natural rhythms. And so maybe it's time to rethink what are our reasons for the season? What do you think, Michelle? Well, so much of the, the holiday, holidays, have to do with, with bringing the light. So imagine that you were living at a time, I mean, you don't even have to go back that far, just before electricity, and how tied humanity was to the cycles and the seasons. And imagine that it's, it's the beginning of winter and the harvest is in. Finally, this, this one time during the year, there's plenty. And so there's a feast and there's storing things away for the coming time. And there, there are pieces of that that we bring in. It's, it's why we think about giving gifts. Um, it, it's tied to that sharing from the abundance that is 
we identified as being sort of our consumer culture, but it's actually a part of who we are as humans, that when we have plenty that we share. What a novel idea. If that were the overlay on, on the holiday, imagine how different, um, I don't know, all the advertising, all the everything would be um, if we were to really tie it into those original purposes for this season. Absolutely, and as UUs, we need to also think about our UU principles and values. And so we do, you know, this examination of the reason for the season is right in line with our free and responsible search for truth and meaning, right? It, our, one of our central UU principles. We can do a responsible examination of this holiday to kind of revisit why, why are we here and what are we doing and what do we want this to be? And as Devin and Emma pointed out today, we also need to keep in mind our seventh principle, which is respect for the interdependent web of existence, of which we're all a part. And think about the ways that our celebrating impacts the planet and impacts our environment and our local communities. So we'll be keeping those in mind as we go along too. That makes me think about a documentary I saw, I don't know, a couple years ago, of this village in China where they do um, the, the red flocking, the fuzzy stuff on ornaments and Christmas decorations. And this whole town is covered in this red fuzzy dust. Imagine breathing that in. Imagine the impact on those people, on their health, on the planet. I'm pretty sure that the red fuzzy stuff is not organic anything. Um, so it's probably not doing the atmosphere any good at all. And it's having an impact. And it's stuff that we pick up at the dollar store, right? You know, oh, it's a, a cute resi, red fuzzy thing. I probably need 10 of those. Um, and, and we don't always think about what is the ripple effect? Who made this? What are the conditions of their lives? And as Unitarian Universalists, I think that's an important question to ask ourselves. Where does this fit into my values? Um, and, and I don't know, there's a bigger circle than just ourselves. Yeah, you know, there used to be these commercials when I was a kid, maybe you remember them too, uh, right around holiday times about getting a new pet for the holidays. And is this pet really, um, it, are you really gonna be able to take care of this pet? And after this little baby chick or this little bunny isn't cute anymore, uh, will you really be still love it and take care of it when it grows up and starts to chew up your furniture and poop all over your house? <laughs> so, you know, maybe we need um, commercials like that to come back, but maybe we need commercials about, you know, the latest electronic toy or uh, the, the new slicer dicer that everyone's buying this Christmas or the little tchotchke with red flocking all over it. Are, is it really worth purchasing this thing? You know, do you really want to devote cabinet space to it? Are you still going to love that electronic with whirly gig when it's two years old and it's no longer working very well and 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 are you still going to be happy with this purchase after it has to go to the landfill and become a part of our earth for the next however many hundreds or thousands of years before it biodegrades so maybe we need commercials like that even though they might be a real bummer i think they would still <laughs> <laughs> still help us to be a little bit more mindful about our holiday excesses. You know, the last couple of Sundays I've been preaching on gratitude and really becoming worthy ancestors. Uh, and one of the things that we talked about was the, the Haudenosaunee people would look seven generations ahead and what the impact of their decisions would be on seven generations. That's over 200 years. Imagine how different things would be um, if, if we had that sort of sensibility in when we are thinking about buying the next plastic thing. Um, what is the impact? And will I be with this for its whole lifespan? Clue, no you won't. <laughs> unless you live to be a thousand years old. Um, and so we can begin to think about the, that bigger picture and helps us 
make decisions about how we give. It doesn't, we're not trying to blow up your holiday. Um, we're, not, we're not here to be the mean, grinchy types. Um, but to be really mindful and thoughtful about how this has an impact beyond yourself. Yeah, so I think we're posing the question here. If, if the reason for the season isn't the buying of stuff and the giving of stuff, then what is it? More about that later. But first, a word from our sponsors. All right, now that our minds and bodies are still, I'm going to invite you to continue to focus on our reasons for the season. And, and this technique is based on a, a Buddhist technique of exploring our, our feelings and our thoughts and our cravings to understand more about ourselves and what it is that we really want and to be more present to the, to the actual reality that we're living in the present moment. So I invite you to close your eyes if you feel more comfortable that way, get comfortable and focus on a holiday memory. It could be a memory or it could be something you always wanted but never got but something that holds a sense memory for you. So either a smell or a sight or a sound that really is the essence of the holiday for you. Okay, do you have a memory like that? Focus on how you felt when you experienced that thing, that memory. And just hang on to that as we have our little discussion. And you can open your eyes now, and we're going to think some more about these holiday fantasies, memories, holiday nostalgia that we all hold. What about you, Michelle? Well, I have to say, when I think back, aside from one or two significant Christmases, um, one of them being the year my two grandmothers got me the same outfit. That was, that was tense. Um, <laughs> um, and maybe the year my parents got me a bowling ball because I really wanted a purple bowling ball. Um, I can't think of like gifts that I think, oh, that, I remember this, the Christmas I got that thing. But what I remember most about Christmas and the, the sort of the sense memory is on Christmas morning, we would go to my maternal grandmother's house, and that side of the family is Swedish. And we would have, and I don't even know if this is real food, um, <laughs> but we would have something my grandmother called egera. Has anyone ever heard of egera? Okay, they made it up. Um, <laughs> but it was just sort of this white gravy made with bacon grease, how your arteries feeling. Um, and a little salt and pepper on a piece of Wonder Bread because it was the 60s and white bread was in fashion. Um, but the, the smell, the taste, just the warmth of that memory. And yes, it was the Egera, but it was also just being with those beloveds and knowing that I belonged. And I think that is the the thing that is the biggest takeaway for me. How about you, Christina? Well, it's interesting. Um, so I came from a military family, so we, we were in many different places over the years for Christmas. So Christmas had different smells and tastes and sights. Sometimes we were in California where it was, you know, there were palm trees swaying and other times we were in places with snow. But the one thing I do remember that I focus on when I do this exercise is a little book we had called The Sweet Smell of Christmas. And it was about a little bear. It was a scratch and sniff book. And there was a page where he had a little piece of gingerbread. And I just remember the smell of that gingerbread scratch and sniff thing. And I remember that more than I remember the smell of real gingerbread because we didn't really have that very often. So this was actually one remove away from reality already because we were just reading a book about gingerbread. But it's interesting. Um, the, the 
researchers that wrote uh, these books, The uh, $100 Holiday and Unplug the Christmas Machine, which is a guide to sort of having a simpler holiday. Um, they say that children, what children really want are four things, relaxed and loving time with their family, so that sounds like the Agora experience for you, realistic expectations about gifts, uh, an evenly paced holiday season that isn't too filled with stress, and reliable family traditions. And I think that book for me was a reliable family tradition because we had it every year, no matter where we were located. So that little smell that I still remember had something about it that there was a memory and a feeling attached to it of comfort and uh, trust that our holiday would be, there would be something familiar about it year after year. So if, if your family always has waffles, it's not the waffles, it's the love. <laughs> it might seem like the waffles and it might seem really important that the waffles are present, um, but it's really, it's the being together. Um, or it's the solitude. If that is your best dream of a holiday, is just you in the quiet, it's still not the waffles, it's, it's you. It, it's what's important to you. We're ready to think about our personal reason for the season because that memory probably holds the key to what your real reason for the season is. So think back to that sense memory you've selected. What was it that gave that so much meaning? What is your reason for the season? There's probably a feeling and a value associated with that memory. Something like, here are some ideas. Connection, closeness with family and friends, reaching out to those far away, reestablishing intimacy with loved ones. Comfort, relaxation, unstructured time, letting go of expectations, eating comfort foods. Wonder, seeing and hearing and perceiving beauty being filled with awe, finding inspiration. Hope, the belief that the future can be good, a feeling of trust in life's promise. Joy, moments of piercing loveliness, peak experiences, sensory delights. Abundance, feeling blessed, feeling generous, sharing your gifts. Contentment, a feeling of peace and being exactly where you want to be. Or your, your reason for the season could be something else. It could be something like creativity or simplicity or even detachment. Only you know what it is. And because we're you use, we can all have different ones. So once you have that sense of your reason for the season. You can use it as a guidepost throughout the next month. You can ask yourself, does this activity or this experience or this purchase, does it increase my level of, and then insert your reason for the season, joy, comfort, connection. If it does, then proceed. Proceed with presence and enjoy yourself. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't resonate with that deepest value of yours, maybe rethink and go in a different direction. So in this month's uh, newsletter, the foreword, um, you will find a whole list of possibilities in Christina's column um, of tangible ways to to celebrate authentically with intention, to think about the impact of our choices, and to make decisions and choices that make us truly worthy ancestors and bring more joy to ourselves and to others and hopefully remove some of the stress um, so that you don't get swept into that rushing madness 
um, that so often accompanies the season. I usually do really well and then it gets to be Christmas Eve and I panic and I, I like run to the store and start buying things. So this year I'm gonna hide my keys because I don't need to do that. <laughs> It's just, I think it's the accumulation of all that, I don't know, all the noise. Yeah, so use your intention to help you pause from all the noise and really get in touch with your deepest self and ask yourself those questions about what you really want to get. And what you want this year could be different than what you have wanted in years past or what you might want next year. Um, it all depends on what's happening in our lives. But I think being intentional and mindful about the holiday season can really help us have a season and, and a holiday that reflects our values and that we can enjoy and be proud of as well. So the point isn't really to stop giving, it's to give the things that matter, to give your time and your attention, to make memories, and to create whimsical traditions if you what to? So in one of, I can't remember which of these books I was reading, there was a family that, that the, the gift they got passed from year to year and you never knew who was going to get it was some terrible holiday tie. And at one time they actually baked it into a cake. <laughs> I'm like, that's fun. That would be a thing that I would really look forward to of, if you're thinking of whimsical ways to um, enchant yourself and others. Yeah, so our wish, our combined collective wish for all of us here is that we have a beautiful holiday season that brings us all joy and presence. Presence and so, with a C. Presence <laughs> with a C. <laughs> and maybe a few really important and, and sustainable presents also. Shall and we sing? And with that, I think we're ready to sing our closing hymn.